Hello, everyone. Uh, and welcome uh, to today's online lecture uh, of the series Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities. This is the sixth event in the series, and we have still five more to go. You can follow the outline of the lecture series and revisit the recordings of past lectures at transportplanning.ut.ee. Today, we are very happy to welcome here in our Zoom space, uh, Professor Margetta Kütte from Aalto University. She will talk about place-based methods in the study of urban mobility and participatory transport planning. Margetta is a professor in land use planning. Her research interests within participatory planning and environmental psychology include human-friendly environments that promote health and well-being, active living, child and age-friendly environments, and new methods for public participation. Her innovation, soft GIS methodology, is an advanced example of public participation GIS methodology. Uh, you participants, if you have questions during the lecture time, please do post them on chat. And we will have the questions and answers section in the end of, le of the lecture. And now, welcome, Margetta. The screen will be yours. Thank you very much, uh, Aket. Just a second, I will share my screen. Does it work now? Now we see um, all your slides. All our, my slide, okay. Just a second, I have to do it again. Mm -hmm. How about now? Excellent. <laughs> Sorry about this hassle. Uh, I have issues That's with Zoom, Zoom always. So um, my, uh, as I was introduced already by uh, Age, uh, uh, I work in Aalto University as a professor of land use planning, but my background is in psychology. So I was originally an environmental psychologist who, may, uh, who defended her dissertation in uh, uh, Department of Architecture in urban planning. So I'm some kind of a mixture between urban planner and an environmental psychologist. And um, uh, now I cannot move on. Okay. So, uh, so it's not surprise to you then that my focus always has been uh, very much in my research work to to do research on the human perspective in uh, planning and of course participatory planning is a big part of that and and let me start by uh, uh, criticizing current uh, practices of participatory planning that uh, in, in my country, in Finland, they, we have developed these uh, already 20 years because um, year 2000, uh, we got a land use um, and a building act that actually obliged uh, cities to always do participatory planning in all projects. But it wasn't so, it hasn't been so easy for the cities to realize this. Um, this uh, kind of uh, obligation and still it is very often the case that only a handful of people participate the timing of participation is quite late um, uh, sometimes the participants seem to concentrate more on resisting changes than finding solutions collected data remains uh, invisible often uh, and, and you cannot talk about influ influential participation and, and very often the, the participation is quite demanding for, for all, uh, for those who arrange participation, but also for those who would like to participate and, and express their views. Um, and, and in Finland, 
public hearings uh, are still maybe the most common method for pu public uh, participation, although it is clear that for all individuals it is not easy to express their views uh, in the middle of a, a, a big crowd where there can be some uh, very strong persons uh, uh, who are like some kind of opinion leaders. And if you collect data, also topic group meetings are very uh, common, especially before COVID. Uh, what happens is that you typically get a lot of knowledge, but, but there are no resources to really go through this um, kind of qualitative data that takes a lot of effort to, to really analyze. So, so alternative or additional uh, public participation methods are certainly needed. And, and, and this brings me to the, the public participation GIS methodology that Ake already mentioned. Uh, in, in my team, we have developed uh, uh, this special methodology already uh, 15 years, because when I heard about um, that there is something called geographic information system that must have been in at the end of the 1990s, uh, I immediately started to dream about a methodology through which we could collect knowledge about human behavior and experiences place-based so that the, the, the experiences would always be connected to very specific locations. They would be geocoded. And, and uh, I was thinking that uh, doing this would actually comprise a whole new knowledge layer uh, to, to GIS system, soft GIS knowledge layer on top of the traditional hard GIS knowledge layers of ge geographic information system. And, and why I thought that this uh, kind of methodology was, would be interesting or useful? Well, I thought that uh, here we would finally be able to do truly transactional place-based research on uh, person-environment uh, relationship, because um, uh, if we here we could really uh, study the active role not only of uh, uh, active people in, in places and spaces, but also the active role of uh, the settings. And, and this would be possible by uh, studying together these two uh, hard and soft layers of geographic information um, uh, that we can collect. But on the other hand, I thought that uh, maybe this kind of methodology would uh, uh, could be used as a new kind of public participation method, because uh, when you link human knowledge experiences to places, you always link them to very specific planning uh, and uh, solution. So therefore, perhaps this knowledge would be usable for planners or more usable than uh, traditional knowledge without this um, geo uh, referencing um, my my dream has came true as you as you know uh, and and in my team we have uh, um, developed this methodology already since 2004 and currently the innovation has been commercialized as Napsenair method uh, that has been used in more than uh, 40 countries already. Um, and I'm super proud of that. Uh, and this methodology uh, has been developed in many stages and it's already, they have published a new version, uh, but you can easily create your own surveys without any coding skills. You can collect knowledge from people even uh, on, online or perhaps in a workshop setting, like in this case in, in Netherlands. And, and the service also includes um, easy to use um, analysis 
tools uh, and, and even people without any GIS analysis skills can, can do uh, quite interesting analysis uh, using those services. So, so let's, uh, let's talk a bit about what, what are those opportunities, this kind of place-based um, methodology really opens up for uh, researchers in the field of um, mobility behavior, for example. There are certain very, I think, um, important um, strengths uh, that you can perhaps reach with this methodology. For example, uh, when you are studying uh, human behavior in different settings, and for example, if you are interested in uh, the health impacts related to certain settings, you are not anymore stuck uh, in studying uh, people living in certain um, postcode areas or, or, or other administrative areas, uh, but you can perhaps uh, buffer each uh, person's home and study the, the, the surroundings, the immediate surroundings of that person. But you don't even have to stay here. You can uh, more dynamically define individual activity spaces where the, where the sizes of the activity spaces and orientations vary. Of course, we all use our settings differently. Or even better, maybe you can uh, study how different parts of your uh, individual activity space are in more or less intensive use. Maybe there are some places uh, like here, uh, your uh, child's daycare center where you walk with your child every morning and every afternoon. So that part of your environment you use quite uh, intensively. While there are other parts in your activity space where you only visit by car once a week or once a month. So it is clear that the, the, the ex, uh, that, that um, this way you can really uh, start to understand what is the environment you are exposed to in your daily life, in your individually um, constructed daily life. And you can perhaps understand that in, in environmental health research, it is quite important to understand this exposure perspective. Uh, and actually, when we have studied, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, aging population, we have learned that these new, the, the, the latter two uh, fine-grained ways to uh, study individual activity space allow us to really find direct associations between uh, environmental characteristics and health and quality of life and happiness variables. We, we never before did find these kind of direct uh, associations, only uh, indirect ones. Uh, we also were wondering before that why don't we find this association between green uh, settings and health um, uh, in Finland. And we were thinking that maybe Finland is so green that there is not enough variation in that greenness variable. But in fact, it, it was perhaps uh, the lack of uh, suitable methodologies because um, when we use the, the most fine-grained, we call it IREM model, uh, we started to find these direct links between green structure and um, uh, health variables. Uh, Kamiar Hassan, the postdoc researcher who works in my team, has also developed a very nice way to look at different uh, activity space typologies, because he have noticed that individuals sometimes live life where, where their activities are concentrated on one node, typically home. So this kind of um, activity space would be monocentric. 
sometimes we have several nodes uh, around which uh, the, our activities are concentrated. Uh, maybe one, two, two nodes, so that, that would be bicentric uh, activity space or more than two um, nodes. Uh, and then we would talk about polycentric activity spaces. Again, we have found very interesting, interesting associations with health uh, variables here. Maybe I can reveal that both among young adults and aging population, monocentric um, activity space uh, predicts higher perceived health. Um, and if, you, if we study accessibility, of course, in mobility research, it is very uh, typical to study accessibility. But what is typically done is that we, for example, only an analyze the, the potential accessibility to green areas that are close to our home, regardless of whether we use those uh, specific spaces or not. And you can do much more fine-grained analysis with this place-based mapping methodology. Uh, for example, uh, of the places by the water that people really use, not only potentially use, but really use. And, and here people have marked those places in Helsinki metropolitan areas, and we have uh, identified the most popular clusters. Uh, uh, among those places, and then we studied um, how equally um, these popular places uh, can be accessed by people using different travel modes. And finally, you can, of course, also try to be more individually sensitive, not only context sensitive, and, and, and you can uh, with this PAD participatory mapping methodology, identify various uh, groups of urban dwellers, because you can uh, at the same, same time study individuals' daily behavioral patterns, but also their values or their preferences uh, that they, they um, seem, seem to characterize them as individuals. So we have done this kind of study also in several cities. And for example, our most recent study in the city of Turku in, in Finland uh, revealed that there are, uh, we can identify four different uh, clusters of people or four different personas um, where the preferences uh, for diff uh, and, and also uh, the daily mobility patterns vary, and, and th these are, for example, pro-sustainable urbanized and auto-oriented resident groups. Again, we have been interested in the health and um, uh, quality of perceived quality of life uh, among these groups of people, and we have got some a little bit. Um, uh, contra contradictory results here, which I have at the moment hard time to explain why certain group uh, enjoys best per perceived health, namely pro-sustainable urbanites, while another group uh, perceives their quality of life best, namely time-conscious suburbanites. Sub but this will be will continue studying later for sure. So these were um, just uh, some glimpses uh, of, I, I would say, some of the specific uh, benefits of, of this kind of place-based approach for the research of uh, human mobility behavior. But let's move on now to talk about the public participation and how this kind of methodology or other methods uh, help realizing smarter participation, maybe smarter than what we can reach if we, if we rely alone uh, to those um, traditional methods like public, public hearings and topic group meetings. 
especially during COVID time, it has become evident to the to many cities that that we we need digital uh, tools also uh, in our collaboration with citizens. So there are already lots of examples uh, of real life public participation projects using this um, Mapsoner methodology. And, and these examples um, uh, vary from green area planning, environmental planning, urban planning to transportation uh, planning, and also to, to individual building design. Uh, some examples from participatory transport planning, uh, I can name that there is, here is a case from New Zealand uh, where, where um, the um, uh, highway uh, has been, or experiences related to a specific highway has been studied. Also, um, there are other interesting projects in um, this is, I think, from San Jose, US, and here is one from uh, New York, where I think they have collected one of the largest uh, maps and air data sets so far, over 10,000 participants here in New York. I haven't personally been involved in these cases, so please don't ask me very detailed questions <laughs> about this. These are just maps and air projects. But uh, what, what, what we did uh, with, with my colleagues, Marit Kahila, Tani, and Stan Geertman from uh, Netherlands, we went through critically over 200 real life public participation projects where maps and air had been used in Finland and beyond. And we tried to find out whether, whether the promises um, related to this kind of digital uh, methodology really come true or not. And the first promise clearly um, relates to the ability to reach uh, larger groups of people and, and perhaps um, performs more inclusive participation than before, uh, because uh, it is very well known that for example, these topic group meetings and, and public hearings, they tend to attract people who are especially interested in, in certain topics. Maybe who, they have special agendas um, regarding uh, specific planning projects. But how about the vast majority uh, of people? Can they, can they be reached somehow? So these have been the questions um, and maybe promises related to uh, participatory mapping. So when we reviewed those over 200 cases, we found out that the average number of respondents was a bit uh, over uh, 460 people. Is this a high number or low number? Well, I'm not happy with this, this number. I think it should be thousands or tens of thousands of people. <laughs> but, but it is 400 or 500 is clearly quite a lot if you compare to what, how many people you can reach with traditional uh, methods. Very seldom you, you can reach more than 200 with, with those methods. So, so maybe this is clearly a step forward in that regard. Um, and then what about inclusiveness? Well, maybe some new resident groups can be reached. For example, people who speak different languages. It is relatively, actually it is very easy to make um, several language, language, language versions with maps and air. We have a case right now in Helsinki where they provide six or seven different languages. And, and among them are languages that you read from right to left. So that all is possible with maps and air. And, 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 and you can reach 
like maybe inhabitant groups that are being have been traditionally seen as as very hard to reach groups like children and young people they are very um comfortable with this kind of mapping methodology uh, here for example um, neighborhood called Lautasari in Helsinki was commented by by 11 year old um, children and and they had a lot to say uh, also about um, um, transport uh, environment for example they knew where adults hit the cast pedal so uh, please avoid that place so so it is clear that the, you can you can use this kind of methodology for example to map uh, uh, let's say dangerous places on children's school routes or whatever other topics you might be interested in children and young people have generally um, had fewer difficulties using this methodology than adults. Maybe they are so uh, fluent with digital tools anyway. But in Finland, perhaps the, the most among the most challenging groups are uh, aging population. Uh, uh, especially those generations who have not used computers in their work life so so they are very hard to they are hard to reach uh, with digital tools so so for this reason my colleague um, colleagues tina tina latikainen nowadays tina rinne and sarah gotwald did a usability study um, among these these user groups and and videotaped their um, use sessions and identified quite a few issues that uh, older adults had when trying to use this map based method and and it was great that then Ma Mapsonair tool was developed according to the findings uh, of the usability study and and then later on uh, Tina managed to collect a very high quality data among older adults, uh, but I think the age uh, age limit was maybe it was from 60 to 80. But but if you if you think beyond 80, then it will be challenging for sure. Uh, how about representativeness then? If if we are claiming that we get uh, we might get more representative groups of people uh, that that would would really um, uh, represent the different um, uh, groups of inhabitants. Um, well, we have found that uh, w w what level of representativeness you can reach in a project very much seems to depend on the uh way you organize your data collection here here you can see two cases above there is helsinki master plan case like where the the planners collected the data using just open marketing uh, very often in uh, certain facebook pages for example and you can see that there are quite severe compromises in representativeness uh, uh, in this case uh, for example uh, age group uh, like like uh, families um, people from 30 to 39 were clearly overrepresented while the oldest age groups were underrepresented but in another study, this is actually the, the study where we, where I, which I already mentioned before, the study where we mapped places by the water. Uh, here you see quite good um, 
balanced representativeness um, in ter terms of different uh, background variables. Maybe the biggest problem there is the education level. Uh, it is hard to reach um, people with lowest uh, level of uh, basic education. That is, that is clear and that comes out in most of the studies, but it is actually a problem that applies to any studies, not only to these made with this methodology. Uh, by the way, uh, because of this, um, uh, the, the cities typically want, or, or they typically really want to use open marketing of these kind of surveys. And this is because of our legislation. If you remember, I said in the beginning that in Finland, it is compulsory for the cities to, to give a possibility for all inhabitants to, to participate. So they think um, they cannot, well, I, I didn't mention that the, the example below was based on random sampling. So, so cities, don't think they can use random sampling uh, because then everybody would not be uh, having this possibility to participate. But what we are recommending nowadays is that uh, let's combine both. And that's what we have done in some latest projects and, and the results are very good. Um, this kind of online um, participation, uh, this kind of uh, um, online mapping exercise is actually a rather rare example of individual participation, where each person have a possibility to share their individual, their, 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 their private um, individual uh, information, their private opinions about things without being um, uh, affected uh, by group opinion. So, so that, that can be seen as an important um, characteristics of um, uh, this kind of online participation. Uh, there are other methods then that, uh, that are examples of collective participation and here and that kind of uh, participation also has uh, certain benefits. For example, there are effective me mechanisms, uh, uh, how uh, like group uh, opinions are um, uh, developed together in, a, in some kind of uh, process. So, so these examples so far uh, that I have uh, explained the, the experiences uh, of this methodology by, by real life, from real life uh, public participation cases didn't uh, vary specifically from transportation planning field, but we did another study where we especially uh, approached uh, transportation planners that had used Maps and Air. Uh, there were some 45 cases here. And, and maybe you are interested to know what transportation uh, planners said about uh, some benefits uh, identified. Well, they were rather impressed about the, the high number of map answers and, and their statistical significance, and, and also about this uh, possibility to use uh, approach um, new and different uh, target groups. They were also interested, or they were also impressed that with this kind of methodology, you can uh, learn about about conflicting uh, aspects uh, in the answers of uh, citizens. And finally, the possibility to collect uh, uh, user knowledge uh, that, that goes beyond standard questionnaire answers, because this um, uh, Mapsionaire tool has a wide variety of uh, different types of questions that you can um, uh, use and then um, 
there are almost no limits uh, what kind of information from users you can collect. So, so let's let's take a look because because the transport planners mentioned about these conflicting viewpoints. So let's take an example from Helsinki Master Plan, where uh, we did this kind of um, uh, mapping exercise and and asked people about two only about two questions. Uh, Helsinki Master Plan was very much about urban densification. Uh, plan and therefore inhabitants were asked only two questions where do they think new buildings could be located and where absolutely not where are uh, areas green areas typically that should be protected so in this map with red and blue you can see all the locations where people have not been uh, agreeing about uh, these, um, uh, whether a place should be built up or not. So, and, and with, 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 if there is more red in that grid cell, uh, it means that the support for new construction dominates in that grid cell. Uh, if the grid cell is blue, it means that the preservation of green area dominates. So, so this is a map uh, where in Helsinki there are conflictual viewpoints. And, and of course, then this is a map perhaps where you should invest more uh, effort in public participation, where you, where you, can, you should perhaps organize um, topic group meetings or other um, deeper exercises. Uh, yes, okay, let's move on. So, so maybe that, so the first promise was about the large scale and, and, and um, uh, in, inclusive participation. The second promise might relate to high quality knowledge and, and, and usable knowledge. Uh, that we can produce with this um, kind of approach. Let's take a look at that. How? So, so, so you can really uh, collect uh, a lot of place-based uh, knowledge, either either knowledge about points or routes or areas. And 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 yes, it is clear that as soon as you have map-based knowledge, it is. It's, it's easy to visualize that knowledge. Uh, for example, here on the left, you can see the places in Helsinki master plan project where people might want to locate new infill projects. And on the, the right, those areas that should be protected. Um, and, and actually, as soon as you start putting uh, dots on the map, um, the, the knowledge, the information starts to have quite a lot of political power too. And, and maybe is, is special, exactly because uh, it is so easy to understand and easy to visualize. By the way, here was a surprise that, that uh, participants in this Helsinki Master Plan survey mapped clearly more places for new building sites than uh, those sites that should be protected. That, that was something surprising because it was very well known uh, from other public debate that, that generally people are very critical towards infill projects. So this was interesting. Uh, let me briefly tell you about a specific project that they did in Helsinki uh, to improve vulnerability of the, the city. Here, this was a smaller scale project, but still during one month, um, 1,600 respondents participated and, and produced uh, over 8,700 routes. Um, uh, that that were asked in the in the survey, 
So, so people were really asked to, to map both everyday routes and recreational routes that were, are important to them in their daily life. And, and here you can see, you know, all these routes are um, uh, geocoded by people themselves. So this is not based on any, any tracking data. So ac actually, as a whole, I would say that people are pretty good in, in, in marking routes, uh, although it is clearly more easy for them to mark just uh, dots. And it, you can then also study uh, more about the characteristics of uh, everyday routes and, and recreational routes. And, and it is uh, probably not surprising to see uh, what is important. Uh, for example, fast and smooth mobility is uh, most important characteristics of everyday uh, routes while uh, the, the natural um, closeness to nature uh, is important in recreational routes. People were also asked to, to map uh, places along uh, the, the, route, the routes that they find unpleasant. And here, here it was quite shocking to learn that this, this map is from very central part of Helsinki around railway station, if you happen to know. So it was a little bit shocking to see that uh, along those routes that seem to be most uh, vividly used, uh, you can also find a lot of unpleasant place markings. So actually, I will come back to this later, this little finding. People also um, uh, expressed their future, their, their ideas for future development, and, and uh, there, there were a lot of them, nearly 900 new ideas. So again, uh, if we turn towards uh, transportation planners and see what they said about this mapping methodology, what, what additional benefits they identified. Well, they, they really appreciated the, the easiness, like easiness for residents to answer online surveys um, from their home, typically, yes. Easiness of demonstrating plans and other visual features online easiness of utilizing data that is directly in, in digital format. Um, even if it's massive uh, amount of data, it is sort of easy to start analyzing because it is directly in digital format. And then the easiness of marketing web-based questionnaire was mentioned and easiness of importing georeference data into JIS analysis software, and finally, easiness of developing surveys by, by themselves. By the way, maybe I can mention here that when we, when in, the, in the very beginning, when we started to develop this um, mapping methodology, we were thinking that it would be a good idea to develop um, certain standardized uh, surveys uh, about topics like uh, perceived safety or daily mobility and uh, whatever, uh, maybe places by, by, uh, in green areas. Um, but, but city planners were saying that, no, they want to create the surveys themselves because they think their case is unique. And that was the reason why the, the survey tool was developed to be used easily. Uh, now, when we have used this methodology for 15 years, I think that now the time might be ripe for also more standardized uh, surveys or set of survey questions. Because if we would uh, more systematically use, let's say, same questions to, to ask about uh, trans, um, 
perceived uh, safety, for example, then the results from different cities would be comparable. Also, you might be able to more easily uh, do follow-up research. So, so that is now maybe under, under con consideration again. Uh, there were, however, also some challenges identified by transportation uh, planners. Uh, for example, challenges related to the, the, the to analyzing these kind of large uh, data sets, uh, or especially the analysis of uh, open comments remain challenging, for sure. And but then. Here, you then have to be very careful when you design your survey and perhaps avoid including too many open comments if you do not have resources to really uh, invest in the careful analysis of that kind of knowledge. The, the preparation effort is there for sure. Yeah, uh, even if the, the tool is easy to use, it is not very easy to, to create a good survey that, that reveals interesting results. That is not easy. So you need education, you need experience to, to create good surveys. And that is actually why I think standardized uh, survey um, uh, tools might be handy. Uh, and when you, when you start collecting data, of course you need to, to put some effort to, to market the survey uh, and, and do some perhaps coordinated communication. Uh, some uh, planners said that it was uh, challenging to estimate total costs. Yes, maybe it is not easy beforehand to understand how much work these different phases really uh, in practice means. And, and of course, the challenge is in learning to implement new, new methodology. It's, it's always there, uh, even if the usability of the tool is, is rather good. Um, regarding different um, analysis uh, possibilities, uh, of, it is obvious that um, you can analyze this kind of place-based uh, data in many different ways and many different levels. I would say that uh, it, planning practitioners very often do not do very sophisticated analysis. They, they often do just explorative ana analysis Put, put dots on the map and do some interpretations. For example, don't really of typically you use this possibility to, to do careful analysis um, um, with those, the layer of soft knowledge and, and hard GIS knowledge that, that already perhaps uh, belongs to this more diagnostic uh, way of using the methodology to, and, and really helps explaining, um, uh, for example, how certain urban structural characteristics are associated with certain type of uh, urban experiences. We have, for example, studied a lot uh, the relationship between urban density or, and green structure proportion with um, um, experiences of urban dwellers. And, and finally, there, there would be also a possibility to do some prediction, uh, to, to do some modeling and, and interpolation with the data set. But, but uh, this, of course, is uh, still a bit more demanding and, and uh, uh, demands certain uh, uh, analytical uh, um, expertise and, and also perhaps you first have to do quite a lot of uh, analysis in these other levels to be able to, to do predictions. Urban planners would be very interested in this prediction level, 
but very seldom so far this has been done. Maybe the next generation will concentrate on this, developing these kind of analysis approaches. Finally, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, effective and influential participation. Uh, there are very few projects so far that have been able to really study the how influential the collected place-based knowledge is in regard to the, the planning outcomes. In, in Helsinki Master Plan project, we were able to do some kind of analysis about um, the, the match or, or mitch, mismatch between the, view, uh, the views uh, expressed by participants via this map-based survey on the one hand, and then the planning proposal and final, final plan on the other hand. And, and this kind of analysis was possible because the, the, the master plan was produced in a little bit unusual um, format, in a grid cell format, where each, in each grid cell it was defined whether this, there will be uh, added, like new infill in that grid cell and to what degree um, new how much new building uh, or whether the, the grid cell would be protected. So that allowed us to do this kind of analysis that we've, we were able to say that in the plan proposal phase, the match between people, the, the expressed um, viewpoints of uh, participants and the plan proposal was 75%. After plan proposal, there was of course huge public debate about the, the solutions, and and then uh, a new a, like new version of the the plan was um, uh, drafted, the the final plan, and we could again uh, study how good the fit was, and it had increased up to eighty seven percent. And this was rather interesting. Um, I, I, I really think that it is essential how you store the collected uh, place-based data afterwards. Um, and in some cities in Finland, in the city of Lahti, in the city of Espo, they have been developing this um, approach that they save the um, the this um, um, place-based knowledge to the same GIS system that the city uh, different city sectors use anyway in their the, their planning and in in their development work and and here you actually realize this original dream of mine that you put uh, the the hard knowledge. GIS knowledge layers and the, the soft GIS knowledge layer together, and you are able to, to really um, use them hand in hand. And, and this knowledge from people come uh, in, the, in part to the same level than other knowledge, uh, a planner or uh, uh, people working in, in other sector in a city. Uh, uh, uses anywhere in their work. I find this very important uh, pre-requirement for influential participation. But this is, of course, another challenging story, how you could you do this um, um, data storage and, and what, what you store and what you don't and, and all that. It's, again, a, a complicated story. Um, I, I promise that I come back to this one map, maybe you remember from city of Helsinki, where there were lots of um, um, unpleasant places along the daily routes of people. That, that map bothered me, and I started to think that, could this, be, this map be used somehow uh, 
if we if we if we develop some kind of prioritization model could we think that those kind of places that we use often in our daily life that are very big part of our daily mobility patterns but that are, are perceived really negatively could could we think that we should urgently do something about those places because maybe they are uh, some kind of health risk or quality of life risk to to inhabitants uh, so so we have been developing this kind of model now in city of espo and 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 we have actually thought exactly this way that maybe this this maybe maybe this uh, category where where people are visiting often certain places but but perceive them very negatively maybe that should be prior prioritized in development and but then there are all these other categories that are of course important and maybe demand different uh, planning strategies each of them but maybe we can now focus on this uh, development priority category we learned uh, first of all that there were not that many of those uh, kind of places only about six percent of all places so even if the the cities uh, of course resources are always limited perhaps they could afford to to focus on five five percent of places that are urgently needing care and um, we also did an analysis uh, where in city these um, different places representing different categories really exist, what kind of land use they represent. And, and we, we learned that uh, places that are negatively perceived, these development and uh, uh, priority places significantly more often can be found in transportation areas and in continuous urban fabric while places that are positively perceived are very often in green areas so transportation areas might be some kind of um, experiential risk for inhabitants and something should and could be done to make them more pleasant environments um, uh, i have perhaps a, a few more um, aspects to to discuss i hope i don't exceed my time too much um, because if you are thinking about participatory planning more holistically now i have spent almost an hour talking about one method method only and you might wonder that do i really think that this one method is good enough to solve our, all our problems in public participation of course not uh, and and my colleagues uh, aya staffans and marit pahila uh, did a very nice model uh, where they first differentiated between participation uh, that perhaps is this large-scale representative uh, participation and collaboration that is more intensive uh, maybe um, solution seeking activity in smaller groups and then they also um, defined uh, diverging and converging uh, knowledge needs sometimes in the planning process there is need to to open up to new diverse knowledge other times there is this strong need to converge knowledge to put them together and and find some solutions and if you combine these these four, two axes you will get this fourfold where you can see that there are different perhaps types of methods uh, that um represent different categories and and clearly map based surveys belong to this category that support diverging diversity and participation but then there are other methods like topic group meetings that are perhaps better in collaboration 
or big room meetings. So, so really, if you think about the uh, very, very well designed public participation process, you should think about how different um, uh, methods support these phases of diverging, converging, diverging, and converging. These ideas were also behind our uh, mind when we just recently developed an online toolkit for participatory planning. Please uh, visit it if you have time. There are 16 traditional methods and 16 digital methods that we are describing. And we are also trying to help uh, uh, the user to to design the, the participatory planning process and uh, from knowing your uh, stakeholders, from defining your goals and selecting methods to all the way to evaluating your process. And, and of course, there are uh, very sophisticated uh, tools to help you pick a suitable method for your case. And, and then finally, there are uh, very good, sorry, description of the different methods and how you can use them and where you find more information. So, so if you are thinking about uh, an ideal public participation project, I would say that you should very strate strategically think about what methods you will use and why and what kind of activities they support in different phases of planning process. It might not be wise to use lots of different methods, uh, at least if you have limited resources for analysis. Uh, while you pick a method, you should also commit yourself to, to, to take all the collected data seriously, invest in the analysis, and, and really try to use the knowledge for, uh, let's say, knowledge, for a better knowledge-informed planning. That was my talk today. I hope I didn't exceed my time too much. Sorry, maybe two minutes. Thank you, Marga. I know you have... Uh, absolutely not violated any any of the rules in, internally here. We are very happy to have heard your presentation today. It was really a great uh, point by point uh, uh, walk through the method. Uh, very you have you have um, provided us um, a very conscious look uh, to the benefits, uh, potential impact. Uh, as well as the challenges of this uh, approach uh, in, in land use planning, in transport planning, and now also finally uh, the location or position of this method uh, in the larger pool of uh, planning aids uh, and these different tools, more traditional and more digitally uh, oriented ones. So I'm really grateful uh, for, your, for your presentation uh, today. Uh, so we are now going to the uh, questions and answers uh, session of, of this uh, event today. Uh, we have already one uh, uh, question in the chat, but in the uh, first round, I would like to uh, offer our students uh, the opportunity to uh, also ask uh, some questions and the members of, uh, of public who, who we have here. Um, so please. I have one here. Nobody else does. Um, I'd imagine that if people ask you this question often, uh, but it's about how you handle the situation where expert opinion suggests that something about planning should be done in a certain way, and public opinion says something completely different. And you think to yourself that maybe public opinion would change if there was some kind of uh, uh, maybe educational or communication effort done uh, in advance or in connection, but that if this isn't done, you get a very awkward situation. And I'll, I will uh, cut myself off, but just to give you a, 
an obvious example. I, I live in what might be a, considered a, an urban fringe uh, village at the edge of my uh, uh, of an urban area in Canada, and we're in the middle of a, a master planning exercise. And of course, uh, expert opinion is that uh, we have potential kind of as a, a node in a sort of polycentric city if we densify and, uh, and go with a kind of mixed use approach. And one of the uh, results of the public consultation was that the, the citizenry wants us to build more single family homes. Mm. <laughs> um, yes. And I thought, well, I, I don't know what we can do. What, what, what could be done about this? Mm. Yes, thank you very much for this question that is, of course, challenging to, to answer. Um, well, I would first uh, start a little bit questioning whether we know the public opinion and, and what is what knowledge is this understanding based on? If you remember this case of Helsinki Master Plan, uh, I, I mentioned that um, uh, it was surprising that people were actually not so... They, they found a lot of uh, places for infill, although uh, in public uh, media there had been so many um, uh, opinions expressed that, 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 that we don't want any, any urban densification at all. So... So oftentimes we, we really don't know what is public opinion uh, if only the loudest voices are there to be heard. That is not the whole story typically. And th then, then the other thing is that um, we, we, we would, in, in our, my group, we, would, we have always highlighted the very early participation. The, the very too often still today participation takes place far too late in the process and and that is a, that is actually a fruitful um, situation for the opinions to be very polarized already if if the planners have worked to certain direction and then then uh, public opinion will be asked only so late that nothing really can be done. So that, that is another um, huge issue that can be solved rather easily by starting the public participation as so early that no, um, no line has been drawn on the paper yet or uh, when when no um, real perhaps real um, strategic uh, uh, goals have been formulated so but but then if 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 it's really the case that there are that the, that the opinions between inhabitants and planners are in sharp contradiction or perhaps opinions of different user groups are um, uh, you know uh, very uh, conflicting then um, there are the, these kind of online methodologies are not the best tools to try to solve the situation there, there is something called um, uh, conflict uh, conflict mediation uh, that can be used in those kind of uh, situation but that actually that means face to face series of face to face meetings where the the conflict uh, will be perhaps in ideal case solved uh, in finland we have at least some very successful uh, cases um, where the conflict has perhaps lasted several decades already uh, after this conflict resolution comes into to play and, 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 and it has been able to do something about it. Yeah. 
Thank you. I, really, I know I, I both forgot to say that I really uh, answer, but I really enjoyed the I really enjoyed the lecture as well. I ca I cannot hear you. Sorry. Just that I, I really enjoyed the lecture. It was excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Karl. Um, so now I will read out a question uh, by uh, or from Sirle Seilmisto from Taltec Tartu College. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your work and knowledge and considering the aging population trends, digital divide and relatively low participation in planning processes and public hearings uh, of old adults. Um, what are your suggestions to overcome this issue? How to involve older adults to public participation processes more efficiently if digital tools, including mapping method, are challenging for them? Uh, for example, accessibility, usability. Yes. Um, well, once again, um, I would start a um, little bit questioning this notion that digital tools are impossible for aging population. Uh, as, uh, as I explained to you, there are examples when successful data, set, uh, data sets have been collected from uh, aging population or older adults very successfully. So we should not fall into this trap of uh, underestimating the the skills of older adults. So that that is of course one starting point. But but if it's if it's truly um, a, a huge issue that um, older adults are not able to use um, sophisticated new tools, then we we, we in in an ideal public participation project we always should have several different. Uh, methods that complement each other. Uh, so one method uh, is better reaching, like in, in Helsinki master plan, plan uh, actually what happened was that Helsinki used perhaps 15 different methods. They, they, they for example, uh, organized all kinds of on, on site events. And in those events, older generations were clearly overrepresented. So the actual problem in that case was, was that how do you attract also younger um, generations? And here the online survey uh, came into good use. And, and, and when the results of this online survey was published, there were a lot of debate in public media saying that because the 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 participants were not uh, totally representative of the general population of the city of Helsinki, these uh, results are rubbish, should not be looked at all. Um, other people were saying perhaps that, that yes, this, uh, this methodology balanced other, uh, the uh, unbalanced uh, representation of other methods. So as a whole, the picture might be fine. Uh, still some others were saying that, in fact, uh, these younger generations are the only ones that are perhaps still alive when Helsinki Master Plan would be realized. So it, in that way, it might be okay if the older generation were underrepresented. So, but this is this is very challenging theme, and maybe 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 I I maybe if I now think maybe older adults are not in fact the, the most challenging group of people to reach. Maybe immigrants are even harder to reach, and that has been shown by some of my colleagues who have done a very ambitious project in a in a suburban area in Helsinki, where there are lots of immigrants and there is an old shopping center that, that is full of ethnic restaurants and ethnic food stores. And now there are, city has some plans to refurbish the, the shopping center. But what typically happens is that the, the rents get so high that the original uh, entrepreneurs have to leave. So now they are they are working together with 
these uh, uh, multicultural entrepreneurs, and, and many of them cannot read. So they are a challenging group of um, um, groups of participants. And in this case, a, a lot of uh, mediation work has been done, uh, uh, planners and, and, and participation experts have uh, really uh, spent time on site, talk to people, help them fill out uh, surveys and, and so on. And, and so far, the results of this participation project have been great, but it is not clear whether city takes those results seriously or not. That will be okay. But, but it's really, really good to hear about this like in-depth approach also to this participation and, and, and engaging uh, certain groups which might not be heard otherwise very, very well. And, and it also seems that this uh, soft GIS uh, type of approach is like very well like complementary to the more traditional ones and, and, and bring new, new knowledge and also the ease of switch between languages. What, what was also fascinating, I, I thought, was that if you could also like provide a, a set of standardized questions as you were talking, but also like a user manual for the users of Mapgeneer. So, so what kind of uh, questions could be uh, could be involved, or what makes sense to involve, and, and this kind of ease the use of this uh, tool for also people who have not used that uh, methodology earlier. Yes, I, I I hope that that could this could be the next step in the development. But let's see. Let's see. Siri, uh, would you like to have a question and then? Yeah, so Stuart. <laughs> yeah, I think it's quite a good time. I, I I have got uh, quite many ideas or uh, topics to discuss, but I think we don't have uh, so much time for this. But I think it was very great. Uh, uh, presentation for this and the overview of this uh, topic. But the two topics or, or the themes I would uh, like to discuss or to ask you, the first was that um, who would be the users of your, uh, uh, this, not the methods, but what you provide, is that more the researchers who do this uh, big uh, studies uh, for city plans or, or are they also some for example, some small private companies who would like to know something about this region around the services or something. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm afraid I'm, I cannot fully give you answer to this question because I'm not part of this company, Mapita, that is um, selling this Mapsioner product. So I don't know their customer profile exactly. Uh, I know that researchers uh, interested in, you know, uh, what, whatever topic that can be studied, uh, place-based, let it be ecosystem service research, transportation research, um, uh, place attachment research, uh, perceived safety research, child-friendly environment research, uh, yeah, you know, and active living research, of course, the environmental health promotion research, you name it. There are a lot of different uh, fields of research that have found this kind of approach uh, usable. But then, then um, urban planners are, I think, the main customer group for this company that uh, sells a uh, Mapsioner met method and and they they use this typically very independently uh, and they also use the tool very creatively there are wonderful examples how they have used all the technical possibilities in a little bit different ways uh, each time in their their projects so that that is very nice to see uh, there are also a complex component like consultant companies who um, work with cities and who are very often the the those uh, parties who act as uh, data collectors. I would like to see more um, this kind of self-organized participation too. And and there are some examples when. Um, 
let's say, uh, neighborhood uh, unions have used uh, this methodology to map the uh, viewpoints of uh, inhabitants more, more largely. So, so there are a lot of different uh, possible user groups. Thank you. And, uh, and the other topics I would uh, like to discuss is uh, related to this uh, com uh, doing the comparison studies. That do you have some experience that somebody has done uh, uh, the studies in different places? And you, you took this uh, standardized methods, but uh, mm. this one possibility, but how it uh, can, can be yes. used for different cities to do um, afterwards some research based on this to compare mm. the cities by, by the experience of the citizens or residents. Yes, um, there are several uh, comparative studies and I probably cannot remember all of them right now. Uh, maybe I can put to the chat the link to uh, to the, the, the web pages that is more research based, uh, where we have wanted to collect uh, the work of researchers from all parts of the world who use this methodology. And uh, I know that there is a, has been an EU project where they had, I think, seven different countries, or was it 10 different countries, uh, where this methodology was used, uh, I think, to map green and blue uh, the 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 use of green and blue blue infrastructure uh, i have done myself a, a, an interesting project where we where i compared the child friendliness of helsinki and tokyo mm -hmm. so it was very interesting to uh, collect data in in tokyo and and compare that with a data we had collected in helsinki yeah. I think it's good idea that if it's uh, somebody is going to prepare some study and look at this, then somebody has done in some other city that afterwards can compare this uh, the data collection to other cities also. And yes, yes, that is absolutely quite easy to to um, to do. So no no uh, worries about that. And uh, by the way, um, I will now. Uh, put the link to to chat, uh, and I, I want to say just one thing about this uh, web page. We wanted to create that uh, a year ago, uh, partly because the I think the greatest scholar in the field of participatory mapping, Greg Brown, uh, who who used to live first in Australia in and worked in University of uh, Brisbane, but later in, in worked in California, and he passed away uh, two years ago. And we wanted to um, appreciate his amazing work in the field and and develop this um, web page to where there is a special uh, archive uh, of his work, and wanted to make sure that his legacy is uh, living. And people thank you he, he has done uh, he has he he was to me a, a amazing role model because without us knowing about each other we had about the same time started to develop this kind of approach and we had taken almost this almost the same steps uh, first for example using uh, like just analog map with stickers <laughs> and he had also used that and then putting that to digital format and but the difference was that he comes from a different field uh, he's working in in ecosystem service research natural resource management and eco uh, ecological tourism uh, type of topics while my work was more uh, concentrated on okay. urban and environments and built environments and and uh, and also Greg wasn't interested in commercializing the methodology but otherwise you know our interests were very similar except that he has published like 10 times more than I have so like, uh, he's amazing scholar so yeah, good thoughts pop up uh, in different parts of the world simultaneously. So, 
this is this is great. So thank you, Marga, uh, once more for your fascinating uh, lecture today. And we could continue our discussion for another hour without any problem. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have to <laughs> have to stop now. So this was the first uh, of three lectures on uh, methodologies in uh, used in transport planning. Uh, next uh, Thursday or this Thursday, uh, we will have um, uh, Marek Rannala um, uh, talking about the role of big data in mobility analysis and transport planning. And next week, uh, on April 12th, Professor Frank Whitlocks from uh, Ghent University will uh, talk about uh, modeling approaches in transport geography, so more uh, conventional uh, methods in, in this field. So this form like a cluster in our uh, lecture series. With that one, uh, I would like to thank you once more and thank you our audience here uh, in this lecture hall and uh, in the virtual space and see you already in the next lectures. So thank you very much. <laughs>